Hey, Andrew, how are you this morning? Hey, how's it going? Awesome. Well, welcome to our morning coffee talk. Uh, again, thank you everyone for joining as we kick off, you know, Insider 2020. We're pretty excited. We have an awesome uh, lineup of speakers over the next two days. Um, and Andrew is going to be starting us off. Uh, Andrew is the CEO of Ramesh. He co-founded uh, Ramesh in 2014 with the mission of helping us understand one another. Um, Andrew's a physicist by training and has spent the past decade applying AI and machine learning algorithms to a wide range of problems from material science and biosensing to peacekeeping with the United Nations. So we're looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, Andrew's going to be speaking on market research, a force for good. I will hand it off to you, Andrew. Cool, thank you. Awesome, all right, let me share my screen. And play. Cool, everyone can see this all right? Yep. All right, awesome, so I'm gonna I think we've got about a half hour here. I'm going to tell a bit of a story about Remesh and how we came to be focusing on a problem for good, uh, where that's taken us, uh, and how our relationship with the UN has evolved. Uh, and then I'm going to challenge us to think a little bit about the role we So I hope maybe uh, feeding information into your mind. And then I uh, would love to have a bit of a discussion on the second half of this, uh, getting your thoughts about how we, how we approach all of this. So, uh, I'll start, I guess, at the proverbial beginning. Uh, 2013, at the time I was a grad student in theoretical physics, uh, and I had friends who were involved in either side of a conflict in the Middle East. Uh, and one of the things uh, that frustrated them, that frustrated me, uh, was the inability for the populations that were being most impacted to be understood by the world leaders uh, that they made it need to make decisions to bring peace uh, or resolve the conflict. Um, the problem uh, was something like this. They were in a state of constant change. Uh, it's the very nature of a conflict scenario. And what that meant was three things. There was a lot of unknown unknowns, which meant that however you were going to try and understand that population, you needed to do it with depth because you couldn't know any of the, all of the answers or all the questions even ahead of time. Uh, the insight would decay quickly. Uh, and because things were changing, this meant that what was true and relevant uh, a week ago uh, might not be true today. And so uh, however they were gonna go and understand a population, they needed agility. Uh, and last, the stakes were high, obviously. Uh, there were lives at stake for and lives lost every day that the conflicts were not brought to resolution. And this meant that they needed confidence in whatever that understanding that they were gonna develop would be. Now, uh, at the time I was looking at, are there existing solutions I can help deploy and bring to the problem? Um, at the time, virtual focus groups, hot now, they're already uh, around in 2013. Uh, they gave depth. Uh, they were generally pretty quick, so you had agility, but they were still happening at small sample sizes, so like 10, 12 people maybe. So you didn't have confidence, so this was a no-go. Surveys, on the other hand, uh, were things that were already starting to happen. I'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, they were doing polls in conflict zones, uh, and this gave them some agility, although uh, not as much as you'd think in, in these situations. They gave them confidence because, you know, you could do this with hundreds of thousands of people, uh, but there's no depth. They couldn't understand things they didn't know they didn't know. Uh, the other thing that people were doing was starting to combine these. They would run a virtual focus group and follow it up with a survey. This would get them depth, this would get them confidence, but uh, this basically hurt agility because it just wasn't something you could do that quickly. And so what I became, uh, people around me would say obsessed with, uh, is there another option that could get us depth, agility, and confidence uh, all in one solution? So that's kind of the genesis uh, of obsessing over the problem. Uh, initially, I didn't start a company. Uh, I did as any good physicist nerd would do uh, and tried to approach the problem like an academic. Uh, figured out a framework to figure out how can we actually take uh, allow a person to have deep conversation with a population like they would an individual, uh, and then built a prototype at a hackathon. Uh, you can see me there with some of my physicist friends. I'm on the right with a lot more hair than I have now. Uh, this was the first prototype we ever built. Um, then in 2015 is when we founded Remesh. Uh, the idea here was that focusing on this problem purely uh, on the for good or purely for, for peacekeeping uh, wasn't necessarily going to be viable. It was going to take time and money uh, to approach it, and so we needed to build a business out of it as well. Uh, in 2016, I moved to New York City. Uh, we moved the company there, uh, and I 
started building a relationship with the United Nations. Initially, I was just doing nights and weekends consulting work for them on things completely unrelated to Remesh, just to learn and understand how the organization worked uh, and to build my relationships there. And uh, important thing happened in 2017. Uh, I hope Donish isn't watching because these are embarrassing pictures of him, but uh, I met Donish Masood and he is really the genesis for everything that happened after this. Uh, he came out of MIT with a focus on applying technology to peacekeeping. And by the time I had met Donish, he had already been at the UN for almost 10 years, uh, focused on bringing new technology to apply to peacekeeping. Um, and he and I worked together a lot in 2017, uh, more say him teaching me uh, how the ins and outs worked at the UN and how you get buy-in uh, and how you position something so that it can actually be used because everybody there is risk averse uh, and there's a lot of bureaucracy. Um, through 2018, uh, I would say this was largely a, we, Donish and I worked to figure out how to navigate the map of bureaucracy um, to position something that was totally new uh, into a system that was founded on things that were highly stable and, and, and traditional. Um, we were going in saying we, could, we think we can uh, help you understand a population in a matter of an hour uh, and when they were used to doing it in a matter of months. And this was a pretty dramatic proposal uh, that meant that we were nearly constantly met with uh, first you need to prove yourself uh, and explain how you're going to solve for kind of all of the risks uh, that are going to be involved in it and also AI is scary so it had a lot of hurdles and blockers and a lot of uh, let's say diplomatic um, uh, political will building uh, during 2018. Um, 2019 is when I think everything really started to finally move quickly. Um, there was a conference we put together at the Alan Turing Institute that involved some of the best minds in both AI and peacekeeping uh, and in understanding populations um, and in mediation of peacekeeping, which are the people on the ground who try and negotiate ceasefire. Um, and out of that uh, came a set of work that we did uh, to basically take a very deliberate uh, and focused approach to unpack our algorithms and our methodology uh, to make sure that it would pass the rigor uh, of what the UN was requiring. Uh, we did this in partnership with both the people we would be working with and then uh, with the people who developed this, which is the Digital Technologies and Mediation and Armed Conflict Handbook that the UN puts out uh, every year or so, um, who focus on basically figuring out all of the ways that technology can go wrong in peacekeeping uh, and helping people think about how to mitigate it. Um, and then towards the end of the year, we started building enough confidence in the approach and enough political will that we actually started talking to a few UN missions, I believe in Yemen and Iraq, um, about how we would actually going, go about doing this in practice. So can we actually take this from theory uh, to practice uh, and use it in an active conflict situation to understand a population? Uh, this year in 2020 uh, is the first year that we actually did this. Um, first one happened on June 10th uh, in Yemen. Uh, you can see there is the uh, special envoy to Yemen, uh, and there's Remesh in the background, um, where they did their first, as they would call it, uh, ma online mass consultation. Um, this was between uh, primarily Martin Griffiths, who is the United Nations special envoy to Yemen, uh, and about 500 Yemen people. Uh, and this ended up turning out to be two, two conversations that they did one day after the other. Uh, and in the room, although I didn't want to put his face or name up here for security reasons, um, was the chief negotiator, uh, I think he called mediator, uh, whose job it is to literally go out and talk to both sides and figure out how to uh, bring a ceasefire about, um, as well as the on the ground people in the mission uh, in Yemen. So kind of all in the virtual room by this because COVID was happening. Um, and on the other side of this was 500 people from Yemen. Um, Maybe if we, we if you guys want to, we can talk about uh, the how hard it is to get 500 people from Yemen, but maybe that's a story for another time. Um, the result of it is that it worked quite well. Um, the most impressive thing that came out of it through the perspective of uh, those in Yemen uh, and those involved was that uh, 24 hours later, there was insights that got presented uh, and they were good and they helped move discussions forward. And this is you know about a factor of 10 or 100 faster uh, than they were used to. So. Now we're partnering with Colin Irwin, who's helping us uh, iterate on all of this, turn it into a playbook uh, so that it can spread. Uh, and as we go into next year, we're going to be rolling it out across missions across the UN um, now that we know how to do it, but uh, and put some lessons there. I uh, want to give a quick shout out to the real heroes here, which are uh, six members of my team who put in all the hard work uh, that is behind a lot of this. Uh, Amr, Shay, Mia, Kate, uh, Anthony and Jeffrey, 
um, who put in a lot of nights, weekends, uh, early mornings, uh, 2 a.m. calls uh, to make all of this uh, happen to get us where we are. Uh, and I suspect we'll be key people helping us uh, move into 2020. So with that, I wanna zoom us out and uh, maybe pluck your brain for discussion. Um, zoom out, I like to picture the world uh, because that's where we live. Uh, and uh, it puts in perspective the fact that like we're, each of us as individuals is a tiny little piece in a much bigger whole. And I think a lot about the future of that world and how to make it good. Um, my naive picture is this, uh, the present turns into the future. Uh, there's human decisions that drive human action and then there's everything else. Um, and those human decision and actions make up basically everything that we do that creates the future. Um, now, a lot of that gets put into making a better future through organizations. The biggest, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they spend about, uh, they, about $500,000 per hour uh, is used to, re to make those decisions and actions steer towards a better future. Uh, that feels like a lot of money, but let me put something else in context here, which is that market research steers about $7 million a minute. So $500,000 an hour to $7 million a minute of that human decision and human action uh, is steered by market research. And so the question is, uh, does that mean that we have an incredible force for good uh, in the world? Uh, not just applying it to problems for good, but overall uh, in how it impacts the world and the direction that it goes. So I'll maybe pause here, uh, and this is what I wanna leave us uh, maybe to think and discuss around, although I guess happy answer questions around how do they view what good uh, for a future looks like? And what is the version, like, what are two versions of the future, one which is good and one which is bad, uh, which market research uh, and the things we learn can help us understand or help us impact? Uh, so maybe I'll pause there. I'm not sure exactly format here. Uh, yeah, each person can kind of unmute yourself or come back on camera and jump into the conversation. Or you can also post it in chat. <laughs> Let me stop my share. Uh, Feel free to show your, your face, chat with us here, uh, though I know it is morning and maybe some of you are still <laughs> pushing up coffee. Nick, thanks hey, for showing up. I wasn't sure if I was showing up on here. You know, I, I just want to hear more about how you got a representative sample in Yemen. I know conflict zones often leave a lot of marginalized communities about the infrastructure to actually communicate with even like the next town over, much less a global audience. So how, how did you select a, survey, a sample that you thought would work well? Yeah, so this is a really good question. Uh, we were, so part of it is we could not select them directly, uh, meaning that we couldn't find a, a firm, you know, to go out and do this. Uh, there was a clever idea that a person at the UN came up with, which is um, there are on the ground organizations that they have a good sense of what the demographics of those organizations are. And they span all of the different sides of the conflict zone. So what we did, uh, what they did was actually recruit a certain number of people from each one of those organizations through their network. And the idea was they would, you know, not perfect uh, quota control, should we say, uh, but a pretty good sampling over the, the different populations that would be harder to reach. Um, and then when they looked at results, they obviously would break it down by those demographics and maybe do a bit of renormalization uh, to make sure that everything uh, matched up. Cool, thank you. Yep. Andrew, I actually have a question, like going back to your process when you initially started this project. Um, so I'm a user researcher on a Medicare project, which is also something that is incredibly bureaucratic, like very, you know, legislatively bound. So I wonder, like, how did you go about finding the right pocket of folks who were responsive to what you were trying to present and really making the case for, for what you were trying to accomplish and, and get stakeholders bought in? Yeah, so uh, I think step one was just brute force. So I, this maybe sounds silly, I would just go to every, like uh, the UN would have these, call them happy hours, where like diplomats and things all drink alcohol on Fridays and talk. Uh, and I would just go explaining what I wanted to do to all of them. Uh, most of them just were glassy eyed and didn't respond. Uh, Donish was the person who got it immediately. Um, and so really it was finding one champion who saw the vision for what we were trying to do. Uh, and then if you note that timeline there, it was another two years before we actually were able to, maybe three years before we actually were able to do it. So uh, I worked a lot with him to understand 
how to get the buy-in uh, of individuals in such an institution. Um, and when it came down to it, uh, I didn't put this in a slide, the way I, I, we learned to, to bring it uh, is to explain not doing it in terms of how many more lives would be lost. And it turns out when you're in a world of political will, uh, that that is a uh, important, that that metric or being able to, it's like ROI, right? You would explain it to a customer, uh, but it, breaking it down exactly to an estimate of, you know, if, if you take six months longer to resolve a conflict because you don't understand what is that equal in lives lost, well, that means that like we should be willing to assume a little bit of risk uh, in doing something that is much, much quicker. So there's a lot of like, I'll call it selling on that front. Yeah. Got it. Thanks. Um, Ellen has said, what, what would the methodology look like for the Yemen research? Yeah, so I mean, the method they use, I guess I didn't talk at all about what Remesh is. So they used our platform, uh, Remesh. It allows you to take a couple hundred people, uh, a live audience of a couple hundred people, and have a back and forth dialogue with them between a moderator. So the moderator will say things, uh, and then they'll ask things like open-ended questions. Uh, when they ask an open-ended question, all of those people will respond at the same time. Uh, they'll, uh, we'll show a few people each other's responses and get their reactions to it. And then we crunch all of that data to show, uh, here is what everyone in that population overall thinks. Um, here's the verbatims that best represent them. And here's the segments that they best represent. Um, and that's shown to a moderator who, you know, that whole process takes about a minute. They read through it. Uh, they learn their unknown unknowns. And usually then they'll follow up with another question that drills into kind of the most important topics that they learn. So, uh, they did this over, I think, two 90-minute uh, conversations um, and probably went back and forth 60 times, 50 times over the course of it uh, with that live audience. Awesome. And then Brian says, polling is good for positive change, but a lot of research is devoted to PL, and is that really good for society? Curious. Yeah, very good question. Oh, did, did I hear you say something, Brian? Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's certainly, I mean, uh, valid and we, as, as do we, and I think that's the idea of what I'm trying to do is maybe make us question it a little bit deeper. Um, I think we've, like we, for, at Remesh, we have some like ethical guidelines we put in place that determines what stuff we do, who we work with and how we work. Um, but there is no clear picture of it. Uh, I think broadly, I think about the heuristic we use is anything that we do, uh, do we think it makes like nudges the world in a better direction? Um, and that's obviously a subjective heuristic, but it turns out if you ask that about most things that you do, we're all like a reasonable human can come to a reasonable uh, conclusion about it. Um, and mostly we'll agree. Sometimes you won't, and that's the beauty of humanity. Um, but I think uh, overall, uh, the nature of a lot of things that are, uh, we would call products, which we're optimizing for, a lot of market research goes into make a better product. Um, and really companies win when they make products that people really, really love. So even if you make a product that you like have really good distribution on and you push it out there and you optimize the system, but people don't love the product, uh, overall, it's not gonna be a business win. So it's not gonna be best for the, for the bottom line or the top line, I should say. Um, so I think that the kind of biggest needle mover that we have uh, or that pushes the world uh, in a direction that is good uh, is making products that people genuinely love, that genuinely make their life better. Um, now, I think the potentially more nasty flip side to that uh, is maybe the, the thing that we could do that is uh, like the least good uh, is to convince people that they need products that they don't need or convince them that they have a personal deficiency uh, that means that like they're an empty person or they're not as good or they're not as beautiful or not or happy until they buy this product, right? And so I think those are two, two wide ends of a spectrum. And I, you know, I picked the most dramatic ones and most of the world is in between. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, it's not, it's not as simple as even product or marketing because I think a lot of marketing uh, has value to help people understand that a product really does solve something for them, right? I have Crohn's. Uh, and when there's a Crohn's advertisement that explains how it works uh, and makes me aware of it, I'm thankful for that, like that, I appreciate it. Um, 
However, when uh, there's a car ad that tells me that I'm totally not cool until I have like the new Rolls Royce or whatever the car of the day is, uh, that makes me feel a little bit down, right? So, uh, and some car ads are cool, I like them, right? But it's so this may be in the gray zone, uh, but that's at least how I think about it. Um, I don't know, how I do you think, think about that, it, Dan? I also think that maybe some environmental challenges are, are baked in as well. I mean, we're making products that maybe have some obsolescence, you know, very quick turnover, uh, disposable, people, you know, what are we doing to our environment? So, you know, we can go down the whole swath there, but the, the balance is important and that we inject also what's for the environmental good. Yeah, certainly. And I would actually say, you know, it turns out that if, most decision makers are aware that their customers don't want things that have negative impacts on the environment very quickly, <laughs> they will adjust. Um, it's remarkable at what I've seen in how quick even the largest organizations can adapt uh, when the desires of consumers shift. Now, it's not actually when the desires of consumers shifts that matter, it's when they learn that the desires of consumers have shifted. And I think that is quite literally like the job of market researchers is to like make that gap be as, as short as possible. I, I have a question. Am I allowed to jump in, Tiffany? Yeah, sure. yes, jump in. <laughs> well, Andrew, I just I just wanted to say it's so nice to meet you. I was sitting in a CPG. We were not solving world peace like you were, but we were selling shampoo. And I'll never forget the day I saw your tool and how you took quant and combined qual and quant and combined it. It blew our minds because we were all doing <laughs> that long timeline, multiple methodology. So like, thank you for pioneering. You know, I mean. And, and as a pioneer, I just want to know what, what's next. You have to be working on the, the next iteration of re market research in this country and the world. What, what's next for you? Yeah, so um, I'll go a little bit further in the future. Uh, so I guess there's two, two big things that uh, I would say over the next probably two years, uh, I, I'm thinking a lot about, we're focusing a lot about, and we're investing a lot in. Um, Broadly, it is the distribution of insight. Um, so I'll, I'll break that down a little bit. So uh, think about it this way. Take your average market research project. I guess my lens is through Remesh, uh, but I'm sure many of you have been involved in these in many ways. Take that and imagine a, a pie chart uh, that has is all of the data that is gathered in that came as part of that. Now, of that pie chart, what slice of that is going to go and make it in the report? Probably it's maybe what, like 10%? that data goes in the report and that report then goes to of the people in your company let's say maybe one percent of the people in the company maybe five percent of people in the company uh, and so now you've had this amount of data that got shrunk to this amount of data that got shown to this many people it turns out that the amount of better decisions that could be made if every person in an organization could access all of the data that was perfectly right for them at the time they needed it uh, as in like with zero friction uh, that you would make a whole heck of a lot better decisions um, than get made today. So uh, I can't say that like we yet have a really good solution to the problem, but that is now the next problem. One of the next problems that we're thinking a lot about is how do we take all of the uh, that data that embedded in it has insight and try to hook that into making it hyper accessible, uh, not just you know within the researcher or the decision maker on a project, uh, but across organizations uh, all over. I think, you know, I expect others, I know others are working on this problem as well. So uh, I think that, that'll be a big next step for research. Right now, research and understanding isn't as easy as Google. Um, it is way harder, right? And I think uh, the closer we can get to it being that easy, the more people will make better decisions uh, overall, uh, and the less crappy products we'll make, and the shorter we'll shrink that gap between uh, the people want change and the companies give it to them. Um, the second piece that we're investing in thinking a lot about is uh, sample. Um, this is a, a you know a giant beast of it uh, of which many people have worked way longer and harder than we have at solving components of it so uh, i won't make any claims that like well we we have uh you know the new magic bullet um but we are working on uh are working on something new related to the the space uh, which because we refer to it as synthetic sample um and it's likely going to be probably another year year and a half before we actually have anything on market um, but the idea is uh can we take uh, I guess it's a 
it's a pretty simple idea. Uh, it is that I, I don't actually need to sample, uh, I can sample 50 people, but if I have uh, data that overlaps with those 50 people and another million people, uh, I can actually take my sample of 50 and gain the confidence as if I had a sample of like 500, right? Um, and so this idea of being able to do that means now I can be a lot more rigorous when I gather that data because I don't need to pay for as many people so I can actually get the right people, which in market research is a thing that most people brush under the rug and don't do. Um, but I can also have high confidence. And so uh, we think that that's a really important lever to start bringing down uh, overall cost associated with sample, uh, bringing up overall quality and confidence uh, and doing it in a way that makes it hyper accessible. Um, I think one of the pieces of our vision uh, is increasing accessibility of all of this. Um, and likely, you know, it's, it'll be years before we really can push, push hard and far. Um, but those are kind of two far out looking problems that we're starting to obsess with beyond just the, uh, you know, right now, obviously we're investing in building our product to make it better and make it faster to make reports and uh, kind of all of the tactical things. Um, but uh, year out, those are some of the R&D things that we're, we're thinking about. Thank you. Can't, I yep. can't wait, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you again, everyone, and appreciate you joining this morning's talk, Andrew. Um, this is, I've enjoyed my coffee and listening to you. I'm sure hopefully everyone else did as well. <laughs> um, so well, our next session is going to be with Chris Plating. He's the Chief Strategy Officer at EPCO, and he'll actually be talking about seven steps to unthink how we approach modern research. So I'm going to post that in the thread for everyone if you'd like to join. And again, thanks, everyone. And we hope to see it some more sessions. We're excited for Insider 2020. Thanks again, Andrew. Yeah, you bet.